OK, I have the recording started. And I want to welcome you all to DocuSign Basics. My name is Susan Lee, Susan Skelton. Um, and if you've done anything with DocuSign up until this point, you have probably talked to me. Today we want to go through just some basics about DocuSign, how DocuSign can be used and some different ways that we are using it on campus. So I'm just going to jump right into the uh, presentation. I'm going to share my screen and then I'm just going to start walking through DocuSign and giving you the information that you will probably need if you use the product. So this is the DocuSign home screen and <clears throat> you see that you have home managed templates, reports and settings. You will always have home manage and reports. Some of you who are building templates and we'll talk about what that is, will have the template option and then the settings are for the administrator. So there's basically three main ways that DocuSign can be used. DocuSign started out just being a way to acquire signatures on a document. So that is DocuSign in its basic form. And all that is is sending an envelope through the process, getting a signature on it, and then routing it to those who were in the recipient queue as a completed copy, or um, maybe adding an additional person into the queue to get a copy. Everyone in the process will get a copy of the completed document at the end. So those documents will reside in the Manage tab. All of the documents that are sent from your DocuSign account will always show up in your sent folder. It will show you the name of the document, the status, and if it's waiting on someone else, you can hover over that and see who it's waiting for. If that doesn't give you enough information, then you can actually click on the item and it will show you the entire process that this item is going to take. So the way that you would send an envelope and DocuSign calls each sending of a document an envelope. So if you think of it in terms of mail, that's where that term comes from. So we're going to just send out a new envelope. So you would just click on new, send an envelope. You would go and grab a document that you wanted to send through. I'm just going to pick the first thing that's out here. It's a case that I was working on with DocuSign. Just some pictures of it. So I've got my document loaded up. Now I want to add my recipients in the process. Your recipients could need to sign it, which means they need to act on it. It doesn't necessarily mean that they are leaving their signature, but they do have to take action. So someone could sign, someone could receive a copy, or perhaps you just need to know that someone viewed it and that would be needs to view. Then there's some other um, permission settings that we can talk about at a later date, but those are the main ones that we use. So, I always tell everybody to check the set signing order box because what that does is it will automatically number your recipients for you and then you can just shift them around or change the numerical sequence if you need to. So in this case, the first person is going to have to act on that document. So I will leave the permission set just like it is. The next person also needs to act on that document. And then the last person that will add just needs to get a copy. So we have three recipients in the process. Three people will get a completed copy of this document. These first two have to take action. The last one gets a copy only. And notice that they are each numbered sequentially. So your first recipient, second and third. If you wanted to change so that the first and the second person are receiving and acting on the document at the same time. You could just simply change the number 
to the same number. It could have been two, but I just made it one. So it doesn't matter the number as long as they are the same and they are in sequential order. So you definitely want somebody to act on the form before someone else gets a completed copy. So once I get the recipient queue built, then I can go down to the bottom and you can enter email text into DocuSign and that email text will be part of the email language that they receive via their Outlook notification. So just like above where we checked this set signing order box, we will set, select the custom email language for each recipient if you need to do that. It may be good enough that you just say, please review and sign if necessary, whatever. I will say that a lot of people, I have found out through the years that a lot of people really don't even read the email text. So if this is a process that you just need to get a quick signature for, or if you just need to um, run it through and let somebody take a look at something, maybe initial it, date it, whatever at the end, and they already know what this is all about, then I would just say, don't even worry about your email text here. It will default to DocuSign language. And the person, when they receive their notification, they're just gonna click on the button that says doc, um, review document, and they will probably understand what to do from there. So, but if you did turn this box on, notice that it gives you three separate areas where you can put email language. And the reason why this shows up the way it did is because I put the default language first. So think about this in terms of what you're going to include in, in any email text. So if there's a paragraph that you want to go to everybody, but then only this last person gets a line that says, please review and file. Then that last person will get this extra line in their email text, but everybody will get this first line. So just kind of think logically through the text before you turn that box on or off to keep you from having to go back and update every single box. If that didn't make any sense, we can talk about that, but I, <clears throat> I think you probably understand <clears throat> what I was trying to say there. So once you get your email language in, your recipients in, your document in, you can also look at the advanced options and you can set reminders or turn them off. And you can set an expiration day or number of days. It is not a date that you can set like an event date but it would be like 60 days from the day that the envelope was initiated or 30 days or two weeks, whatever you need it to be. Most of these other settings I turn off um, because usually you don't want a person to change the signing responsibility. Now, if you're sending this to a, a dean, director, department head, some of our leadership and they're not available to sign something or they are not the right one to sign it, you might choose to leave that box turned on. Uh, but for the most part, it's going to who needs to sign it, at least usually here on campus. If it's going off campus, you might need to turn that on. Allow recipients to edit. That allows the recipients to take a little more control of the envelope itself. They can reroute it. They can correct it some other things that you might want to reconsider before you turn that box on. This box right here will prevent individuals who are not acting on the document from even seeing the document. So if you had three documents loaded up here in our um, envelope and person B was only signing the second document, if you turn this box on, then person B will not see this first document, but they will see this one and this one only. And then the auto navigation is, is not really useful. Generally, we put the tags on the form in the order that they need to be acted upon. So that hasn't 
come to light to be very useful um, at this point. And then there's also a comments feature which allows you to kind of carry on a conversation about the document outside of the document and all of those comments that pass back and forth within uh, individual emails are stored in the audit trail of the document in DocuSign, but they are not stamped on the document. So I generally turn this off and if somebody has some question about this, I just tell them to give me a jingle. Let's just kind of talk through the scenario and see if that's something that you might want to use. So once you have your reminders and your expirations set, you just save those settings. And at this point, we're ready to mock up the document with the fields that we need to use to capture someone's signature or perhaps some information that they need to enter on the form. Oh, OK, this error message is because I used myself in the same place twice. So what I'll do is I'll jump back over here and I will change this. A different email so that I won't have that error message. OK, so the document that I loaded up, um, it was just a picture of something. So you're you're not seeing double or crazy or anything. It's just the document that I chose to load, but you can visualize that this is your document right here and it's full of you know columns and rows where you need to collect data a name a cwid address uh, classes that someone's taking the semester they're in all kinds of different uh, pieces of information and what you will do is for each person who we have designated as needs to sign they will have a color-coded order in this list so we're going to work on the first one first. So for the first individual who's acting on this form, we need to collect their signature and a date. I realize that's very small. Can't, can't fix that one. Um, and then we'll move on to the second person and then you would do the same thing. So the second person needs to sign it. We want the date that they signed it and they also need to add more information to the form. So if you have multiple text boxes on the form and it doesn't matter where they're at or what they are, if you have multiples, you can highlight them all at the same time and change the properties which show up on the right hand side. You can change the properties all at one time. So for example, I've just clicked and dragged around all four of these fields. I'm going to mark all of them as optional. So I just turn off that required field box. I'm going to format them in a different font, for example. So we'll make it an eight and, you know, color, whatever. And you can underline bold. There's not a whole lot of formatting, but there is enough that will help you make something stand out or, you know, be smaller or larger, uh, small, yeah, smaller or larger if you need to. So we've got all of those properties set for those four fields. The other things in the properties area is sometimes if you are wanting to capture some reporting data out of these envelopes, you might need to change the name of the data field. It defaults in as just a text box, that's all that means, and a bunch of random numbers and letters that are unique to that particular field. So if you wanted this to be, you know, like comments from supervisor, whatever, we change that data label and then if we were doing reporting on it, then that data label would make sense. We can talk more about that later. That's not something that everybody does and that is not something that's native DocuSign. It's a custom process that we built behind a completed DocuSign envelope. You can also put a tooltip on an item. So you might want to say enter phone number as 
205-555-5555. So kind of give them an example of how you want them to enter the phone number. You can also have validation on one of these text fields and we can make the validation be several different things. It can be a social format. It can be just numbers, just letters, an email format and so on. But whatever you choose here, they have to follow uh, with that particular format. But you can do that. And then the last thing that I'll talk about here is collaboration. So let's say you have a field on a document and it's going through several different hands and there is the opportunity for someone down the chain to be able to make a change to this field. So it starts out as one thing, but three persons through the process, they say, oh no, that's not exactly correct. I'm going to change that. So as long as you have marked this field with recipients can collaborate, then any person in the process can make a change to that field. It's either none or all right now. I'm sure that that will change at some point, but right now it's either everyone or no one can collaborate. And then beyond just being able to collaborate, you could, you could uh, require that their initials are attached to it or you can require for everyone to go back for it to go back through the process again and everyone can sign it and or initial it. The main goal here is that the document has been changed since it left someone's hands. So the idea is that it needs to go back through so that they can see exactly how this how this ended up. All right, so once you get all of your fields on the form, then you're ready to send it. So just a little bit more about those other fields that we didn't really put on the form, but some things to be aware of. <clears throat> so signature, initial, date, sign, name, email, company, and title, all of those are items that default from your DocuSign account. Your initials and your signature are just a matter of you clicking on it when it's your turn to act. The rest of it comes from your account. The text box we've pretty much talked about. Check boxes are optional check boxes. They you can have someone select one check box or if you have a series of check boxes they can select none or they can select two of the three or one of the three. The point is the check boxes are optional. Drop downs and radio buttons act the same way, but they're they look different. They're presented differently. So a drop down, you would come over here to the right and you would add your options. So we're going to say First one is test one, second one is test two. That's what it would look like for the drop down. And notice that the drop down just takes up one space on the form. The radio button uses up more real estate on the form, but sometimes that's necessary or sometimes you're you're using someone else's form and you can't really change it, uh, but you can run it through DocuSign. So you could put, you know, circles, these radio buttons, on the form wherever the description is of which one they need to select. So for the radio buttons, sometimes we would want to label this and say, um, so that's the whole group name, but each individual button might be active. The next button might be um, reserve. And the last one could be. So they have to select one of these. But no more than one. And that's how that works. There are also attachment fields, so if anywhere throughout the process you needed someone to have the possibility to add a document to the process. 
you can add the attachment field again for whichever person needs to add the document. So in this case, we're going to put one for each person. So we've got one for the first recipient, which is blue. We have another one for the second recipient, which is yellow. But we don't want those to be required. They default in as required. You can look over here on the properties side and see that. So we can highlight both of these at the same time and turn off that box. And now they are optional documents. While we have this highlighted, I want to show you an, an easier way to line up things on the form. So we put this, you know, one to the left and one slightly to the right, but we want them to line up underneath each other on the form. So you highlight both of them. And again, all I'm doing is clicking and dragging around it. As long as you touch each of them, that's all you really need. So you drag around each one of them and then you line it up to the left or to the right. If it's vertical, you line it up to the top or the bottom if it's horizontal. So we're going to line this up to the right by clicking this second icon right here. So it right justifies both of those items. So now they are in perfect alignment. You could also align horizontally. So if we wanted these two items to line up together, they look like they do, but one of them is slightly off. So let's say we want to line this up horizontally to the bottom. And what it's going to do, it's going to go horizontally to the lowest item. So this attachment tag is going to move and be at the same level as the text box. So when I click this guy, you will see that shift just slightly. So now it's lined up perfectly horizontally. There are some other fields that you can use in DocuSign. They don't all act like you might think. Um, formulas have a little bit of specific things around it and approved decline process that probably will not act exactly the way you would think. So if you want to use any of those, just give me a little jingle and we can talk through that um, just so you understand how it works. So once you get all of your fields on the form, you're ready to send it. So it's going to go in order. First, it's going to go to Susan Lee Skelton, and then it's going to go to Susan Lee. And it will not go until the order has been fulfilled. So in this case, we actually have it sent to both people at the same time. And I realized that I did that, and it's like, no, that's not what I want to do. I don't want Susan number two to get it until after the first one has signed it. So I would come back over here perhaps and change that to two. So now it will go exactly in sequence. This person gets it first, then this person gets it, and then finally a copy goes to this person. So once I change the recipient order there, I'm ready to send it. And because I'm logged into DocuSign, it's asking me, do I want to sign it now? But if I pull up my email, I will have an email. Here is my email. This is the email that I just got. And it's asking me to review it. See, most people are just going to jump right here, click the button and go. But notice that this is the text that we added to the text section. So that could be altered and we'll look at the very last one so you can see the difference. But anyway, you get the item in your email. You click on the review document. And if this is the first time that someone has received a DocuSign envelope to act on, there will be a little disclaimer up here that they are using a, an um, electronic process and that they are who they say they are and they agree to the use of this and so on. So they'll just have to check that box and then they click continue. Then they would review the document um, and click and sign their signature. And of course the date automatically fills in. Once they have acted on every field that belongs to them, they just click finish and it will go on to the next person. Okay. 
Okay. So I'm going to do the other one from within my account just to keep from having to jump back and forth between email. So I'm in my sent box. I sent that envelope. It now tells me it's waiting for others and I can hover over it and I can see that it's waiting for Susan Lee. Susan Skelton has already signed it. So because I'm one in the same in my account here, it's, it, it doesn't know the difference. But if I go to my inbox, I send it to the actual same email address. So I can go to my inbox and because that's really the same person and same email, it's waiting on me to sign. Oh, I didn't. I'm so sorry. I did not do that. I sent it to my Gmail account. Sorry about that. So I would actually have to get out, go into my Gmail account and click on that link, or I would have to be in my Gmail account in DocuSign. And I'm not going to take the time to do either one of those things, but just know that this person who is srlysunshine at gmail.com would have to log in or open their email and do the same steps that I just did for that first person. Once that person signs, then the third person would get a copy. So we can see more about this in just a few minutes, but that is how to send an envelope, just a one-off envelope. So this is good for, you know, you just, you, somebody laid something on your desk and somebody needs to sign it and that somebody is out of town or on vacation, whatever. You can scan that document up, attach it to this process that we just did by new send an envelope. You can put the little labels on it where they need to sign and date and send it. And then when they receive it in their email, all they have to do is click on it, review it and click to sign and it's done. So now I want to move on to the second way that DocuSign was created to be used, and that is to create a template. And a template is a placeholder for all of that information that we just put together. So we put together, um, we put together the document itself that we wanted to send. We had a whole list of recipients that needed to receive that document and what permissions they needed to be in order to act on or view the document. Finally, then we had the email text that identified the text that they see in their Outlook email when they get the notification. So all of that information can be bundled up along with the tags that are on the document, the signature tag, the date signed, the text boxes, all of that. All of that can be bundled up and saved into a template. And that way you can reuse this over and over and over. So I'm not going to go through all of those painstaking details that we just went through, but I will show you the creation of the template, how to use it, and then one more way that you can actually use it after that. So if I wanted to create a template, I would just go to my templates tab. And again, this is permission based. So some people will have templates because they're going to be building templates. Other people will not have templates because that's not what they do. They just need to be able to send and manage their documents. So the templates builders would go here and create a new template. Just click create template. They would name the template. Now in the past, we've asked everybody to kind of give it a naming convention so that if you had to call me and needed my assistance, I would be able to find the template from which a document was started. So we asked that you do something like this. Um, so the first characters are UA and a space. Then the second set, if you will, is the area that you are in. I started out kind of creating these areas for people, but as we've expanded the use of DocuSign across campus, 
everybody has their own little way of identifying themselves or their department. So that's kind of fallen by the wayside, but if you will give it some, some name that will help me try to find it in the future, if necessary, that would be helpful. And then after that, after the space, OIT space, you can name the template, whatever you want to name it. Doesn't matter after that. Okay, so you name the template. That's the, So far, that's the only thing that's different is you give it a template name. You can put a description in here if you would like. Then you go and get your blank document that you are going to use in this template. Um, Well, I'll just get a blank document. That'll probably be easier. So you go and grab your document and attach it. You can have multiple documents if you need them. You set the signing order. And in a template, you give someone a role name. So a lot of times we do this. Initiator is the first person. And then it might be advisor. And then it might be department head. I'm just making all this stuff up. And then finally, department admin. Okay. So once you get everybody who's in the queue, oops, I didn't mean to put those in the name field. Not sure how I did that. I guess it defaulted to the name. Once you have the role names in the template, if you have people in the process that stay in the process, so for example, the department head would be the department head for a while. So you could go ahead and put that person in the recipient queue and it can stay that way. The advisor, you know, different students are gonna have different advisors. So if it's nine out of 10 times, it's a certain advisor, you could do it. You could go ahead and put that in there and then we'll set the permissions to allow this to be changed or you just simply leave it blank and it will be optional. And then the initiator obviously is the person who starts the process. And then at the end, the department admin is just gonna get a copy of this particular envelope and anything that comes with it. The information at the bottom is all the same, so you could go ahead and preset all of the text that needs to go to each of those recipients. Entire message, all recipients. Okay, so I put that in there first because I want everyone to get this line in their email text. If I check this box, now everyone will get that line, but I want this last person you and file. I want that last person to get a little bit different message. So none of that's different. It's all exactly the same at, except for the role name. It's the same as when we were just sending a one off envelope. Right now we're building a template. So once we get all of that in there, then we go to the actual document. And again, these steps are exactly the same. You drag and drop whichever field needs to go on the form and the location of where it needs to go for each person who is in the queue. And obviously all of this depends on how the form is built, the layout and everything as to where you're putting these boxes. I'm just putting them on the form for illustration purposes. So when you get all this information on your form, then you can start looking around at your properties on the right hand side. Now you cannot change the properties for the signatures except to make them required or not, and a little bit of formatting. That's really all you can do with the signature boxes. But you can also highlight it like I have here, and then you can make it smaller or larger just by dragging it. So you can do that. 
Um, so those maybe would be, oops, those maybe would be smaller depending on, you know, the form that you're working with. The text boxes are the same as we discussed before. They come in as required, but you can turn that off. And notice that when I turn it off, the background becomes white, whereas before it was highlighted. And again, you can make a signature not required if you need to, but for the most part, why would you be putting it on the form unless it was required, right? So, So once you get all the tags on the form, then you're going to save your template. Okay, so the template's been saved. The template owner would need to save this template with you if the expectation is that you as an individual would be able to use this template to send out your own envelopes from it. So I'll show you what that looks like, but most of the time, if that is the case, the template owner, the person who built this template, is going to turn this template into what DocuSign calls a power form, and they're going to send you a URL or put a URL on the website somewhere that will allow you to click on that link and initiate the process on your own and you don't even need an account. So there's sometimes when you would need an account and sometimes when you wouldn't. So it just depends on your each each individual situation. So if you had an account and if this template owner wanted to share this template with you, then what you or the template owner would do to use it is you would log into your account. You would go to the templates area. If it's a template that you created, it's going to be in my templates. Otherwise, if it's a template someone has shared with you, it will be under this shared with me section. Okay, so under my templates, which is where we were, you would log in, go to templates, go to probably shared with me or, or my templates, depending on your situation. Go to the template that you want to select, click use, and it's gonna pull up the recipient list as it has already been built. So we had an initiator, we had an advisor, we had a department head who we say would probably not change for a while, and then we had department admin who's receiving a copy. So you would fill in all of these steps with the person that needs to receive this. You could also go to the advanced options, which I didn't do in the template because it's exactly the same as what we saw when we were creating just an individual envelope. You would go into the to the options here and you would turn your reminders on or off and you know perhaps turn off these extra check boxes and turn off the comments. So you can do that on the fly like we're doing here or you could have done that while you were building the template. I skipped over it because we had already done it but it's exactly the same thing. You can build it at the template level or do it on the fly as you were sending the document. So once you have all of the recipients in the list, remember we've already built the template. So we have all the tags on the form and everything. So all we need now is to actually send it. So that template that we built has been sent and the first person is Susan who's getting this. So Susan needs to sign and this field is optional, but there was a text box there for recipient number one to fill out. So they're finished. I'm just going to stay in my account at this point because I'm the next recipient as well. Should be in my inbox. So here's the one that's coming to me. I need to sign it, so I just click the sign button. 
Meanwhile, I am receiving email notifications. So click continue. So here's the second line for the second recipient. And then remember the signature was smaller, the date, and then they're finished. I know this is the boring part. You're like, get on with it. But I want to get through a whole template so we can talk about the, the end result. So the third person also had to take action. So that's this person. So they're going to Pull it out, sign it. They're finished. So now the fourth person, who is also me, will receive a copy, and all the other three recipients also receive a completed copy. But it shows you here from your inbox because you were part of the process. But generally, I tell everybody to, to look in your sent box for anything that you're trying to find. It's just easier to know that everything you sent out is going to be in your sent box. Everything will not be in your inbox. It will only be in your inbox if you actually are receiving the document as a recipient in the process. So back to your sent box, it shows you the item that it's complete. And then after that, you can actually look at the history of this document. And you can see every step that this document took throughout the process. And the IP address and everything of where it went and who initiated it. At the top, it's got your basic details. You know, what's the name of the subject line, the envelope ID, when it was created, when it was sent, and where it went, and what the status is as of this moment. Because you can open this history up at any point in time. So the status could say waiting for others or in progress, but because it's already finished, of course, the status has been changed to completed. This holder is the owner of the template. So that's me. So you could be sharing a template. Someone could be sharing a template with you and that other person's name would be right here, even though you're the one who used it and sent an item through the process. OK, so the last thing that DocuSign will allow you to do is to create a URL for a template that will allow anyone to initiate the process without you having to be in the middle of it until necessary. So you could come to your template. Now remember, if it's not your template, you can't do this, but the template owner would come here and create a power form. I'm going to get an error. Oh, no, I won't. I didn't put it in there. I was going to say, if you create a power form, you cannot have a person in slot number one because slot number one, recipient number one, is always going to be filled out by the person who initiates the process, the person who clicks on the link to use this power form. So let's finish the process and then you'll see how this acts. So this is the name of our template. This is what we started with. You could change this if you wanted to. Might get a little confusing, but you can. You can change the subject even, subject line of your email even. But usually everybody leaves the subject line the same as what it was. They might though add, in this case, um, we'll just say the initiator. We're gonna add the initiator's name into the subject line. So the assumption here might be that the initiator is the student because then it's going to the advisor and the department head, whatever. So in this case, the initiator may be the student. So we want the student's name in the subject line so that everybody who receives this notification through their email will know what student they're working on. Then here, this text right here just kind of guides the initiator as to what they can do when they start the process. And you'll see this in just a minute, I promise. So we're just going to say add your name 
and the name of any required recipients that are not listed below. Okay, good enough for now. We'll see this in a second. So that's kind of the beginning, the, the first page that someone sees when they use a power form. So we're going to create the power form. We're going to copy the URL because we want to use it. So this URL is actually in our demo environment. And I'll talk a little bit about demo and production in just a minute, but um, the demo environment will send emails wherever you tell it to send emails. So if you're ever working in the demo environment and you're just testing or trying out new features and functionality, be sure that whoever you're using in the recipient list knows that you're testing that what they're receiving is not real. So here we're going to paste that URL in so you can see what that looks like when someone clicks on the link to use the power form. So we can see our little line that we added. Add your name and the name of any required recipients that are not listed below. That's probably a poorly worded sentence, but you know what I'm trying to say. So here is your name. So we'll put your name. And then here are the other individuals who are going to receive a copy of this envelope throughout the process. So we'll just do the same thing on here. Then the department head. The department head is actually already there because we put it in. We could have locked this down so that this cannot be changed. And if we had done that, they wouldn't even be seeing department head. It would just, it would just wouldn't be there. And same thing with department admin. That person is probably someone in the department that receives all of these forms or all these envelopes. And that person's name could could go in there and um, they wouldn't even have to see this. It would just be in there and and um, it's a required field, but it also cannot be changed. So they wouldn't even see these last two if we if we set the permissions that way. But we didn't, so we had to put in all four pieces of information. And then we're going to cl click begin signing. And then all of this signing part is all exactly the same. None of this has changed. So I'm not, I'm not going to belabor all of this, but this is exactly the same. Meanwhile, I'm receiving all of my notifications through email. I'm just not flipping over there to to act on it from email. I'm just doing it from within my account. Sorry for the silence. I'm just trying to get through the process. That was three. So the last person is just going to receive a copy only. And so that should be it, I think. Yes, that was the last person. So that's the only difference in the power form and the template. So you have to have the template first. Once the template is built, then you can turn the template into a power form and share that link on your website or share it with individuals in an email or any other method and explain to them click on this link and follow the instructions so that's the uh, power form in a nutshell but again you can send just a one-off envelope that's the very first thing that we did we just went in here to manage and did new send an envelope the second thing we did was we actually built a template. So we did new create a template. And then the last thing that we did was we took the template and we created a power form. And that power form just creates a URL that you share. And if you needed to 
do something like you want this email to originate from, let's say, the department. We might also have a departmental DocuSign account where we change the sender of that envelope to that department name. So in other words, the person who built this template, Susan Lee Skelton, is currently the sender. So when somebody receives a notification, the notification is going to say, um, please DocuSign on behalf of DocuSign Susan Lee Skelton or something like that at the um, as part of your email. I think it's got my name, Susan Lee Skelton via DocuSign or something like that. That's what it looks like. But if you wanted that to say, Department of Human Resources via DocuSign, what we would do is we would have a Department of Human Resources DocuSign account, and then we would come in here to the PowerForm and we would change the sender of the PowerForm. So right now, this sender is me. But if I wanted this to be someone else, I would find that departmental account. And now when the notifications go out, it's going to say Department of Human Resources Learning and Development or whatever that said, and via DocuSign. So instead of it looking like it comes from Susan Lee, it's coming from HR Learning and Development. So that's the basics of DocuSign and how it can be used one last note, um, I talked about us having different environments. So we have a test environment or a demo environment, and we have a production environment. As with any product, the production environment is not for playing around and trying out new things. That is what the demo slash test environment is for. So if you just need to send envelopes and get signatures, it is perfectly fine for you to get and use a DocuSign production account. If you want to develop processes, test them out, have other people involved in it, make sure everybody's good with how the process works and the way the forms look and all that kind of thing, you want to be using an account from our demo environment and just let me know that you need that because I don't always do that. And then in other cases, I will do that first before I even give you a production account. So it just depends on the situation and the scenario that's being described. But just put in a help desk ticket. If you need a DocuSign account to send envelopes to get signatures, if you want to learn how to create templates and try out some of the new features and functionality in DocuSign, then when you put in your ticket, you could also put in there that you would like to have a demo account. And then I will coordinate with you via that ticket and let you know what's coming when. Usually I'll send out the demo one first, and then I'll send out the production one after that. And then you can always email me and if you have any questions, DocuSign has a great support site. So it's just support.docusign.com. And once you get out here, you can usually find just about anything that you want to find um, about signing a document in DocuSign, for example. The challenge here, as with any other product, is you got to know exactly the phrase or the topic and the way that they name it in order to know how to look for it. So you would just, you know, search generically to start with and then try to narrow down what you're really looking for. But if you can't find what you need or if you just need a little bit of discussion about how you want to use DocuSign, then by all means, reach out to me. My email is srlee at ua.edu and um, you can reach me there or on Teams, either one. I'm pretty much glued to the computer most of the day. So I can help you in that fashion and we can talk through your processes. I can help you build your templates. I can build your templates for you and turn them over to you. Or you can have control of 
everything around your DocuSign account. I have played all roles in this process. So if you tell me, nope, I want to do it myself, that's perfectly fine with me. Or if you say, I really don't have time nor the inclination to learn a new product right this minute, can you just get this going for me? I can do that too. So either one is fine, doesn't matter to me. So with that, I'm going to conclude the meeting and hopefully you will be able to um, jump in there and get some things done with DocuSign as soon as you request your account. And if you have any questions, just let me know and I will close this meeting out and turn off the recording. Thank you for participating.